Hi everybody, this is Dr. Bricker here with uh, a video of um, chapter 4. I'm going to go through the PowerPoint and uh, I don't think we'll get to Newton's third law today, but we'll get through most of the chapter 4 PowerPoint. So we've talked a lot about uh, describing motion. We haven't really talked about what causes the motion yet. So in this chapter we're going to get to the causes of acceleration. Um, so again, the first part of the, of the semester so far has been describing motion, kinematics equations, graphs, motion diagrams, things like that. Now we're going to move into what's actually causing this motion and what causes acceleration. So this chapter is all about forces and Newton's laws of motion. So we're going to establish a connection between force and motion. And it turns out if you have an acceleration, you have to have a net force. Okay, so what exactly is a force? Uh, push or pull interaction between two objects. So there's always two objects involved with a force. You can't just have a force by itself. Um, so an agent, in this case the woman, is pushing something, the object, the car. So there's always an interaction. There's just not a force by itself floating around somewhere. Okay, so um, this chapter we start to talk about forces. We get a pretty good um, foundation going with forces and then also chapter 5 deals with some applications of something called Newton's laws which we'll get in this chapter. Okay so acceleration is caused by not just forces but having a net force. You could have a whole lot of forces on something and it's not moving. So for example if you have a book sitting on a table gravity's pulling straight down on the book that's a force. Um, there's something called a normal force pushing back up on the book but there's no net Force, so there's no acceleration. So you have to have a net force for acceleration. So larger accelerations require larger forces for a given mass. And we'll learn something called Newton's second law that, that will relate this all together. Okay. <clears throat> so the hammer exerts a downward force on the nail in the picture, but the nail also exerts, uh, exerts an upward force on the hammer. It turns out that those forces are actually equal to each other. So for every action, there's a reaction. That's really Newton's third law. Now you might say, well, there, the force on the hammer cannot be the same as the force on the nail. It turns out the force is the same, but the hammer is a lot bigger than the nail, so the hammer doesn't really care. If you're driving your car down the highway and you hit a mosquito, the force on the mosquito from your car is the same as the force on your car from the, from the mosquito, but the, the uh, mosquito is so much smaller, it really feels that force to a greater extent. It's the same force, though. Okay, so forces, uh, motion, and reaction forces. That's all this chapter is about. Okay, so you can kind of tell what's going on here from the first picture. So this is some smooth snow, so constant speed. So from here to here, uh, constant. But then once you hit uh, uh, less smooth snow, we're going to come to to rest. So this is actually more like real life. Smooth snow, uh, I, should, I said constant velocity, but not really. We're actually slowing down. If you look at the distance between here and here and here, although there's maybe not a lot of friction, there is some friction. On Earth, there's always going to be friction. So we see that this, uh, the person on the sled actually uh, slows down. Now on ice, you might be able to go a little bit farther. As you can see here, um, you go farther, but you still slow down. <clears throat> then, and that's our experience every, everyday life on Earth. Now, if you had frictionless surface, which we don't have on Earth, so this is maybe hard to, to imagine, but you, if you did really have a completely frictionless surface, the velocities would stay constant the whole entire time. So a lot of these problems will say uh, ignore friction. Well, in everyday life, you always have friction, so you have to kind of use your imagination here. In the absence of any kind of force, though, an object in motion will just stay in motion. That's what you see in C down here. And as you can see here, an object has, it should really say, no net force acting on it. Um, if it's at rest, it will remain at rest. If it's moving, it will con continue moving in a straight line. No net force. So what exactly is a force? Push or pull acting on an object. Uh, every force has an agent and something that it acts on. So forces aren't just by themselves floating around somewhere. Uh, Force is a vector, so all the stuff we did with vectors this semester will work out. So when will we need this? Well, if a force is acting at some kind of angle, you might have to figure out how much of the force is in the x direction, how much of the force is in the y direction. 
Okay, this little arrowhead above force here just reminds you, don't forget, you have to break it into X and Y components. Some forces are contact forces, where objects are literally in, in contact with, with each other. Some forces are long-range forces. So this picture down here represents gravity, a long-range force. Magnetic forces are also a long-range force. Um, so in, in Physics 220, we don't really talk about <clears throat> magnetism and electricity quite yet. But, uh, but if you take Physics 221, you will. In this class, the long-range force is gravity, the force of gravity. Okay, so just a little reminder here, if you're going to draw a vector and an object, the dot is the object, and then the force is the, uh, is the arrow here. So relatively speaking, the longer the force, the bigger the arrow would be, and then you draw it at the correct angle. And then you can label it whatever you want to. Here it's just labeled a generic F for force. Okay, so you can draw a picture. That's what's going on here pictorial representation of the box. So the rope is really what's connected to the box. So the rope is providing the force here. Um, you might not want to draw a box every time. If all the particles in the box move together, you could represent the box just by a dot here, or just a point. Makes it a lot easier. Here's a long-range force. Here's the weight pulling down. So the force of gravity is called the weight. Force of gravity, weight, the exact same thing. Okay, you might have a whole bunch of forces. So experiments show that when several forces, remember this arrow above here just means, don't forget, you've got to break it into its components. When they're exerted on an object, the, com uh, the, the combination is the net force. So when it says vector sum, it just means add up all the x direction forces independent from the y direction forces. So this is kind of a shorthand way of saying that. I mean, this is not useful the way that it's written. This just means, okay, we're going to have to figure out the net force in the x direction. We'll have to figure out the part of F1 in the x direction, the part of F2 in the x direction, etc. Same idea for the y direction. When you get that, it's called the resultant force. So this is, the, this is what you get after you add up the x parts. You get a resultant force in the x direction, um, resultant force in the y direction. Okay, and that's what this picture over here shows. Here's a force at some kind of angle. This has X and Y components. This one just has Y components. So if you were to add these together, here's, uh, here's F1. It has an X and Y part. Here's F2, which is straight down. So you have to break them into components to figure out the net force. <clears throat> okay, let's see what we have here. The net force on an object points to the left. What is the missing third force? So you have F1 and F2, but the net force, they're telling us in this example, uh, points to the left. What is the missing third force? Okay, so when you um, take F1 and F2 and F3, which is not there, you want the net force to point to the left. So right now, the way that it looks, there's a force that's up, that's F1, there's a force that's to the right, F2. So we've got to cancel out the F1 that's up because they're telling us the net force is to the left. There's no up or down force. So we've got to make the resultant force at least as big to cancel this one out. So I'm drawing this is F3 this direction. And then I've got to have uh, at least enough to get rid of F2 because F2 is to the right. I want to put enough to actually whoops, cancel out F2 and then I'm going to have to make it a little bit bigger actually. Darn it. Okay, so this uh, this one I can call F3 in the X, this one F3 in the Y. <clears throat> so F3 in the Y is big enough to cancel out F1, which is up. F3 in the X is big enough to cancel out F2, and then give me a little bit more because that would give me a net force to the left. So the resultant force would look something like this. This would have to be F3. Technology's not working so great today. There we go. So this is F3, right? It has part in the X that you can see and part in the Y. So the closest answer here is C. Good, and that's a better picture, actually. So uh, next time we meet in class, we will take a look at 4.6.
sort catalog of forces? Well, we've talked about the weight, so the force of gravity. Anything with mass is attracted to anything else with mass. So the center of Earth has a lot of mass. I have mass. I'm attracted to the center of the Earth. The center of the Earth is also attracted back towards me. But again, the Earth is so much more massive than me, the Earth doesn't care. I care, though. That's a big force on me to the Earth. It's, it's, it's not. So the weight is one that we'll see a lot. Spring force will come back to when we do simple harmonic motion. Well, it turns out, though, if you compress a spring, which you're seeing in part A here, compress the spring, the spring force is to the right. Now, if you stretch a spring out, which you're seeing here in part B, if you stretch a spring out, the force is back to the left. So um, while the spring is behaving and not stretched or compressed too much, where it still remain, uh, can, uh, keeps its elastic properties, we'll, have, we'll come up with something called Hooke's Law. So more about that later. Tension. So whenever you see a rope, we have tension. So tension is al always a pulling force. If you have a rope, it's never going to push anything. It's always going to be pulling. And that's what you see here in this picture. Okay, so here's the rope. And the tension in the rope is pulling this direction. So if you just represent the sled with a dot here, here's the direction of the force. Always pulling. <clears throat> the normal force is always uh, perpendicular to the surface. So normal in this context means perpendicular to the surface. So if you have your physics book resting on a table, you could imagine it being like this. What's actually holding the book up? Weight's pulling down. What's the force pushing up? You can think of all the uh, molecular bonds of the atoms that make up the table as compressing a little bit, kind of like springs, and they provide the normal force. So where, whenever objects are actually in contact with each other, we have the normal force always perpendicular to the surface. Okay, here's a skier going down a hill. What's the normal force on the skier? Well, here's the surface here. Perpendicular to the surface would be this way. So that would be between the hill and the skis. And uh, we usually use little n here for normal force. Uh, friction, we'll get into more detail in the next chapter, but we start talking about here. Like normal forces, always exerted by a surface. It's always parallel to the surface, and it's the, in the, usually in the opposite direction that we're moving. There's two different kinds, kinetic friction, and it's usually uh, F sub K for kinetic friction, or static friction. So static friction is the frictional force if something's not moving. So you try to push a box, you're pushing on a box, it doesn't go anywhere. That's static friction. Now if you can break it loose, and you're pushing a box across the floor, then you have kinetic friction. So static friction is greater than kinetic friction. Okay, and we'll get into that in a lot more detail in the next chapter. Okay, so here's a sled moving to the right. Kinetic friction is back to the left. Here's a crate that's not actually moving. So if you're pulling um, this direction, what's keeping it from moving? Static friction is back this way, right? If it doesn't go, static friction would be this way. Your pull is to the left. It's not going anywhere, so forces are balanced. Okay, good. Drag force we'll talk a little bit about as well. It's really the frictional force between an object and uh, the fluid that it's flowing through. So by fluid, it's a substance that can easily flow. So air or liquid. So as this leaf is falling through the air, there's a drag force back upward. So like kinetic friction, drag force is always the opposite direction that you're moving. In a lot of problems, you could ignore air resistance. So uh, assume that there's no air resistance unless they tell you that there, there is air resistance. And we'll see that in this chapter. Thrust force, uh, just called F thrust here, is uh, in this example, the uh, force from the uh, rockets pushing this uh, ship up from the jets, I guess. Okay, and that's what's actually propelling this forward. Okay, Electra, uh, electric and magnetic forces, um, strong and weak nuclear forces. We don't talk about that until we get into uh, physics 221. Okay, let's see. A steel beam hangs from a cable as a crane lifts the beam. What forces act on the beam? Let me see if I can switch over to this pen. So what are the forces acti actually acting on the beam? So um, a, it just hangs by a cable.
Okay, so let me give it an easy one here. Not quite working. There we go. So there's the weight, which is straight down. Um, that's an easy one, weight. So if that was the only force, the, there would be a net force down. There's got to be something that's balancing um, the weight of the beam. And it's the tension in the cable. Okay, so the weight's pulling down, tension's pulling up. These are actually equal to each other because they say it's just hanging there. There's no other actual forces. There's no like outside force called the net force or anything like that. These are literally the actual forces acting on the beam. Just the tension and the weight. Or, you know, gravity and weight are the same thing. Okay, excellent. These are the ones we would be voting on if we were actually in class together. <clears throat> A bobsledder pushes her sled across horizontal snow to get it going, then jumps in. After she jumps in, the sled gradually slows to a halt. What forces act on the sled after she jumps in? Okay, so gradually um, rolls to a stop. Let's look at the, at the forces. So we've got the weight. That's always an easy one. In this case, we've got the normal force, right? That's got to balance out the weight. And then the, uh, the bobsledder is going to slow to a stop. So this is just while moving again. So we're going to have to have kinetic friction back the other direction. Now, if you notice, there's no force forward. There's nothing propelling the bobsledder. The bobsledder's in there. Uh, to get going, the bobsledder pushed the cart. But then the bobsledder jumps in and then slowly comes to a stop. So there's nothing that's keeping the bobsledder. There's no force pushing the bobsledder forward forward the bobsledder just has momentum so what takes that away actually is kinetic friction so gravity normal force and kinetic friction the force of the push is already gone right because it's just after the bobsledder jumps in okay great so identifying forces so um, I'll just give you my take on this so identify the object of interest so it's whatever you're talking about in the problem like the previous one was the bobsledder Draw a picture of the situation. So sometimes that's helpful to, to draw the actual picture out. Um, some of these, uh, like draw a closed curve around the object. I don't do that usually. Um, and I won't count you out on the test if you don't like draw the picture, draw an object around it or anything like that. The way I do it is I usually represent the object by a dot. Look at the forces acting on the object in something called a free body diagram. Okay, we'll just have to get some practice with that. So here's just some uh, list of forces. The weight we talked about, really the weight is the force because of gravity. Um, spring force, we'll get that to that later. Tension, we'll see a lot of that. Normal force, static friction, kinetic friction. Okay. And again, you can call these things whatever you want to, but usually these are the um, symbols used. It took me a couple of years to figure out what this picture was. This is actually a bungee jumping a jumper hanging upside down by their feet. If they would have put a smiley face on the bungee jumper, you might have been able to tell a little bit better. Uh, and we want to know what are the forces acting on the bungee jumper. So let's see. A bungee jumper has left off a bridge nearing the bottom. What forces act are being exerted on the bungee jumper? So there's tension on the bungee jumper because the bungee jumper is attached to this uh, cord or whatever it is and then there's the weight force so tension and weight if I were just gonna do this I would just uh, do something like you know here's the weight and then here's the tension I just drew them equal to each other this is just at a point where they're equal to each other we don't really know what what point this is if you're nearing the bottom probably the tension is uh, greater than the weight though right because that's what stops you and then pushes you back upward Okay, uh, this problem is similar to 4.11, so uh, when you do 4.11 on the homework, refer back to this problem. A skier is being towed up a snow-covered hill by a tow rope. What forces are being exerted on the skier? So these are just the forces exerted on the skier. Well, the skier is in contact <clears throat> with the hill, so there's going to be a normal force. Um, the skier is being pulled up by tension because of uh, apparently holding a rope. So we've got the tension force. Um, 
We also have the weight, which would be straight down, and then we've got some kind of kinetic friction. Okay, so we've got tension. We've got the weight, which would be straight down, the normal force, and then we also have kinetic friction. Those would be all the forces. All right, let me just do a little bit more detail on this problem. We give you some kind of incline like this. We've seen inclines before with chapter three. I'm just going to represent the skier with a block here. So the normal force would be perpendicular to the surface. Tension would be up the incline. Weight straight down. Now, if the uh, skier is moving at a constant speed, forces up the incline this way would be equal to forces down. They don't tell us if the skier is slowing down, speeding up. I'm just going to give you the direction of what, what can, uh, friction would be. I don't know how big it is, so I'm just going to put it this direction. Okay, so normal force is perpendicular to the surface. Tension is up the incline. Kinetic friction is down the incline, and the weight is straight down towards the center of the earth. Okay, so what do forces actually do? Um, as the block moves, starts to move, in order to keep the pulling force constant, you must move your hand in the right way to keep it constant. So in this picture, you see uh, the velocity vectors getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So initially this uh, is uh, speeding up. So there has to be an acceleration. Whenever there's an acceleration, there has to be a net force. Okay. So experimental findings of motion of objects acted on by forces are an object pulled with a constant force, moves with a constant acceleration. That's a key point. Constant force, constant acceleration. So acceleration is directly proportional to force. So the bigger the force, the bigger the acceleration. On the other hand, uh, acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. So for a given force, um, the larger the mass, the smaller the acceleration will be. Okay, so the bigger the force, the bigger the acceleration. The bigger the mass for a given force, the smaller the acceleration will be. And they're directly proportional to each other. Let's take a look at this quick check 4.5. The cart is pulled to the right with a constant steady force. How will the, its acceleration graph look? Well, we just said if the force is constant, the acceleration is constant. The first one here the acceleration is getting bigger. Here the acceleration is getting smaller. Here is where the acceleration is actually constant. In choice A here, if this were velocity, that would look, that could be what the graph looks like. But it's not. It's an acceleration graph. That's why A is not true. It's got to be C. Constant force, constant acceleration. Why is it constant? Well, it's some number here, and it's not changing. So a constant force produces a constant acceleration. Whoops. Let me do one thing. Okay, excellent. So we're almost to the point where we can talk about Newton's second law. And actually, this is Newton's second law. A force causes an object to accelerate um, directly proportional to the force. So what you see up here, the bigger the force, let me grab a highlighter, the bigger the force for a given mass, the bigger the acceleration will be. On the other hand, inversely proportional to uh, how much mass we have. So for a given force, if you have a larger mass, you'll have a smaller acceleration. Putting both of those together, we get Newton's second law, which is, this is the way I think you should think about it. The net force is m times a. Don't forget it's a vector quantity equation, so it's really a couple of equations here. Whoops. Go back to pen. And really what this means is the net force in the x direction is mass times acceleration in the x direction. And also the net force in the y direction is the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. That equation just really means this, these two things. Okay, good. So that's just a reminder of you got to look at the x direction independent from the y direction. Uh, let's see what we have here. A constant force causes an object to accelerate at 4 meters per second square. What is the acceleration 
with twice the mass. So remember, F is equal to MA. A constant force causes an object to accelerate at 4. What is the acceleration with twice the mass? So if you make the mass twice as big from this equation, keeping the force the same, so you have to keep the force the same, make the mass twice as big, the acceleration is going to be ha have to be half as much to give us the same net force. So uh, 2 meters per second squared. The nice thing about Newton's second law is there's, not, there's no one-halves involved. There's no nothing squared. It's just F is equal to MA. Okay, an object that uh, when pushed by with net force F has an acceleration of 2 meters per second squared. So net force F, we get 2 meters per second squared. Now twice the force is applied to an object that has four times the mass. Okay, don't forget, F is equal to MA. Okay, so twice the force. Okay, twice the force would boost the acceleration up to four. But now we've got four times the mass. So now we're going to have to cut it by a factor of four. So doubling the mass made the acceleration go up to four meters per second squared. But then making the mass four times as big, we'd have to cut the acceleration uh, by a factor of four, leaving us with one. So we go from two up to four, but then we have to go back from four to one when the mass is made four times as bigger. Okay, excellent. All Newton's second law. A 40 car train travels along a straight track at 40 mph. A skier speeds up as she skis downhill. Uh, on which is the net force greater? So remember the net force is m times a. A car travels at 40 mph. They're telling us that this is a constant velocity, right? 40 mph. This means the acceleration is zero. There is no net force on the train. There's a whole bunch of, of forces. There's the weight, the normal force. There's uh, the engine of the train pulling the train forward. There's friction pulling the train backward. Um, but because it's going at a constant speed, the acceleration is zero. There is no net force on the train. There is a net force on the skier, though, because the skier is speeding up. So the skier actually has a net force. The train does not, so therefore the skier's net force is larger. Okay. An object on a rope is lowered at a constant speed, which is true. So lowered at a constant speed. Now if this was just hanging around, this uh, object, to get it moving um, downward, the weight would have to be bigger than the tension. We're just looking at the point now where it's going at a constant speed. The net force, in other words, is zero. So we've got tension this way. Whoops. Weight this way. Wait. Okay. Let me start over. We've got. Uh, do it over here. Tension this way. Weight this way. Constant speed means no acceleration. So these forces are actually equal to each other. So if you're in an elevator descending you feel like a little uh, jolt in the beginning. That's when the weight is bigger than the tension. But when you're cruising down, um, you don't want to keep feeling that jolt, right? Especially in an elevator. So you get to the point where the weight and the tension are equal to each other when you're going at a constant speed. And then if you're descending in an elevator before you get to the uh, where you're going, then the tension's got to be bigger than the weight for you to actually slow down and stop. Okay, so equal. The unit of force is something called a Newton. From Newton's second law, F is equal to M times A. So the mass is in kilograms, the acceleration meters per second squared, and that's equal to a Newton. So a kilogram meter per second squared is a Newton. So the symbol for a Newton is a big N. Now be careful, the normal force, which is a little n, is also measured in Newtons, which is a big N. Okay, so just for reference, a pound um, that's actually a unit of force. A pound is uh, about 4.45 newtons. So the SI unit of mass is kilograms. The uh, English unit of mass is actually something called a slug. But around the surface of the earth, a pound is about 4.45 newtons. Let's take a look at this FET. If it'll work, let's see.
All right, so let me click on this then. This is actually going to be the lab that we do this week, something based on this FET. So FETs are physical education, uh, physics educational technology. And I'm going to look at, I believe, acceleration. So in this FET, I could apply a force to this crate and try to get the crate moving. So I can increase the amount of force I have. Let's see. So I'm applying 50 newtons actually here, and the crate's not moving. Let me actually uh, list a few things here. Sum of forces, that's the net force. Uh, acceleration, mass. Okay, so we've got 50 kilograms. Here's the box. Nothing's going on now. So this is static friction because it's not moving. I can slowly increase it by just a few at a time. So if you notice, the guy's actually kind of moving down, trying to get this thing to move. We're all the way up to 100 newtons, and it's still not moving. Okay, getting closer. 121. It's still not moving. I'm going to have to overcome static friction. Oh, I just have. Around 126 newtons, I've overcome static friction, and now this thing is moving. And uh, we have some kind of acceleration going on. 0.64 meters per second squared. So there's a net force. I have 126 newtons to the right, 94 newtons back to the left. I have a net force. Whenever you have a net force, there is an acceleration. So 32 newtons is equal to the mass, which is 50 kilograms, times 0.64 meters per second squared. You could check it out. That is the net uh, force. I can slow this thing down by throwing another crate on here. And now it's going to actually slow down. Kinetic friction in this case is bigger than static friction and then we're going to slow to a stop here. So here's the speed. You can see it slowing down, slowing down. I could even slow it down faster by putting a refrigerator on there. Take the fridge off. Now there's uh, not slowing down as fast. I could put uh, a kid up here. Maybe the kid could hold this. Yeah, there we go. And then it slows down even faster until now it's not moving at all. To get this to move, now I'd have to apply a really big force. So you can kind of play around with it. It's a pretty fun FET, actually. But you can see how this works out. Um, there's a whole bunch of forces right now. There's the applied force. Here's static friction. I'm talking about on the crate. There's the weight of the crate, the normal force. Um, we've got all these forces. There's just, there's just no net force right now. Okay, so more about this when we talk about the lab. Okay, here's an example we can take a look at. A Boeing 737, which is a small, short-range jet, mass 51,000 kilograms, sits at rest. Okay, that's, that means the initial velocity is zero. We, still, we can't forget what we did in the first couple of chapters. The pilot turns the pair of jet engines to full throttle, and the thrust accelerates the plane down the runway. After traveling 70, or sorry, 940 meters, the plane reaches 70 meters per second and leaves the ground. What is the thrust of each engine? Well, what we can do with this problem is figure out the acceleration of the plane. We can do that with kinematics that we had before. So the acceleration is to the right, as you can see there. Um, the speed keeps getting bigger and bigger as the plane goes down the, uh, the runway. And this is similar, by the way, to 4.24 on the homework. So we want to figure out, really, what's the force of the engine? Well, if we can figure out the acceleration, we, we can use that to figure out the force, and we're assuming that there's two engines. Okay, so starting at rest, you go up to 70 meters per second in a distance of 940 meters. We've got to use uh, kinematics to figure out the acceleration. Okay, and then we'll figure out the net force. Each engine provides half of that. So this is one of our kinematics equations that we had. Final velocity squared is equal to initial velocity squared plus 2a times delta x. And we're starting from rest. So this term here is actually 0. So we don't know anything about the time. So that's why we're not using the kinematics equations involving time. We do know the final speed, and we know the displacement, and we know the initial speed, so we can figure out the acceleration. So do a little bit of algebra to this equation. You come up with this. Everything's in SI units, which checks out. You get 2.61 meters per second squared. That's the acceleration. So knowing the acceleration and the mass of the plane, we can figure out the net force.
So uh, m times a, that'll give you the net force, 51,000, 2.61 meters per second squared. Kilogram meter per second squared, that's a newton. That's the total net force. Two engines, each of them has have a half of that. So about 67,000 newtons, or if you want to write it in kilonewtons, one kilonewton is a thousand newtons. You could write it in kilonewtons. Okay, excellent. So this acceleration is about a quarter of g. So um, take 9.8 divided by 4. This is about that. So it's it's reasonable. It's zippy, but not a thrill ride, which that's how planes should feel, right? And again, this is similar to 4. Point, or sorry, do 4.18 and 4.21. We'll do that in class this coming up week. Okay, free body diagrams, not just fun, they actually really help you solve problems. They take a lot of verbiage in problems. I mean, we write down what we know, what we're looking for, but this is a nice uh, way to represent it and clear everything up. So identify the forces acting on the object. So not the forces that an object might be imparting to some other object, just the forces acting on this object. Um, coordinate system you automatically kind of draw a coordinate system. You've got the x-direction and the y-direction. You don't have to really label a coordinate system. Represent the object as a dot. Draw the vectors uh, you know, uh, on, acting on the dot. So the forces are the, are the vectors. Okay, and then we can figure out which way the net force is maybe from the problem. It takes some practice. An elevator lifted by a cable is moving upward and slowing. Okay, so the acceleration must be down then. Which is the correct free body diagram? So first of all, what are the actual forces acting on an elevator? So if you think about it, an elevator, the weight is always going to be there, and we've got tension in the cable. Those are the only actual forces acting on the elevator. Now it's moving up and slowing down. Okay, so if, let me start representing these forces. Uh, we've got tension up. Whoops, okay. Tension up. Now they're telling you it's moving up and slowing down. So it's got some momentum upward. But if it's slowing down, the weight's going to have to be like this. The weight has to be bigger than the tension. That means the acceleration is down. So this is already, we're seeing the uh, elevator already in progress. So it's moving upward, but it's slowing down. So at this point in time, if it's slowing down, the weight has to be bigger than the tension that will cause it to slow down. Now if it were accelerating upward, the tension would have to be bigger than the weight. Going at a constant speed, those are actually equal to each other. But in this case, it doesn't really so much matter that it's moving up, it's the fact that it's slowing down lets us draw the, the vectors like this, as you can see here. So I called it weight, they're calling it force of gravity, same thing. Let's see, a ball is tossed straight up, which of the correct free body diagrams just after the ball has left the hand. So you have to think about what are the actual forces on the ball. You throw a ball in the air, what are the actual forces acting on it? We're assuming no air resistance. The only force that we actually have is the weight. It's got momentum going up, but that's not a force. It was already moving that way. It's the weight that's pulling it back down. That's the only force. Okay, here's another one. A ball hanging from the ceiling by a string is pulled back and released. Which is the correct free body diagram just after the release? Okay, so you got to think of the actual forces acting on, on, this, uh, on the ball. So weight is going to be down. What are the only actual other forces? Tension. Now if you release it, it's going to move, but there doesn't have to be some kind of uh, other force that's moving it. A part of the weight actually is what it makes it rotate, but uh, th these are the only actual real-life forces acting on the ball, just like we have here. Okay. A car is parked on a hill, which is the correct free body diagram. So it's on a hill, it's not moving. We want to look at the actual forces. Okay, so the car is in contact with the hill, so there's a normal force. We've got force of gravity this way. So what keeps the car from actually sliding down the hill? It's friction back this way, and it's actually static friction. So you might say, okay, we, we see static friction going to the left. Why doesn't the car start moving to the left? But remember, this. Uh, if I'm looking at this like we are here, x and y direction, this weight has a part this way and a part this way. 
and uh, the part of the weight that's down the incline, this one, has got to be equal to static friction that's back up the incline. And all the forces are balanced then in this picture. The weight being the one that, we, if we look at it like x and y, we can break that into its components. So those are the only actual forces acting on, on the car. Uh, let's see, a car is towed to the right at a constant speed. Ah, so right away, constant speed. That means there's no net force on the car, which is the correct free body diagram. So first of all, with the car, normal force, weight, tension is this way. Um, no net force means if I've got tension to the right and it's this big, I have to have kinetic friction back this way. And then, uh, then there's no net force. Whatever's to the right, force-wise, is equal to whatever's to the left. Whatever's up is equal to whatever's down. And those are the only actual forces. So again, no net force doesn't mean no force at all. It just means that there's nothing left over. It's like balancing your checkbook. You made this much money. You spent this much money. You definitely had income coming in. You had some going out, but no net, nothing left over. Okay, so forces on an elevator. Here's an example. An elevator suspended by a cable speeds up as it moves up. Draw a free body diagram of the elevator. Okay, so if, if it's speeding up, that means the net force must be up. It must be accelerating up. So for the acceleration to be up, because the net force is up, tension has to be bigger than weight for that to happen in this example. Okay. So tension drawn larger than the weight, giving, giving us a net force upward. Okay. Uh, let's see, the elevator is moving up, speed is increasing. That means the acceleration is up. And uh, yes, that's exactly why we've, we've drawn it like this. And again, we'll do problem 4.33 next time we meet in class. Okay. Newton's third law, and we'll save that for the next time we meet as well. So this is an introduction. The biggest thing to get out of, of this um, chapter so far is F is equal to MA. That's Newton's second law. And I'll just put the little vector here, sign here, to remind us this is a vector equation. you got to look at the x direction independently from, from the y direction. So this is Newton's second law. Newton's first law, an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by a net force. That, uh, there's no equation for Newton's first law. That will just help us solve problems. And in a way, it's already helped us look at some free body diagrams. Like for example, the car that was being towed with, uh, at a constant speed, we knew because it was a constant speed, there was no net force. So whatever's to the right force-wise is equal to whatever's to the left. Whatever's up is equal to whatever's down. So constant speed means no acceleration and therefore no net force. As long as there's no net force on that car, it would just keep going at a constant speed forever. Okay, hopefully this was helpful. Again, we'll go over some of these problems. That's where we really can kind of internalize Newton's second law here. And then we'll also talk about Newton's third law. And that will, again, have no equation, but it will help us solve some problems. Okay, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.